Independent journalist Anna Therese Day was reporting in Bahrain this month when she was arrested by local officials. Luckily, Day was released along with her three colleagues and she joins me now to discuss her experience. I mean, you know, when you were arrested, uh, how did the police treat you? Uh, you know, at first we had a pretty cordial professional uh, interrogation. Uh, they this, is in a, this was in a station. This wasn't outside. This wasn't when you were in a car. Yes. This was when you got to a station. Yes, they brought us right away to police station. Um, they were very professional at first. Uh, we did enter on a tourist visa. We made that risk as, or we made that calculation before, uh, and uh, I right away they, they actually brought me a picture of me uh, in an op-ed that I wrote for HuffPo, and they had pulled up the article. It was about a Bahraini human rights activist. Yeah, we have that article here as well. <laughs> what was that like? Obviously, there's this detente where they said, well, how did you get in? You said, we didn't, you know, this is how we got in, and we're surprised too. Um, it seemed like the mood kind of shifted a little bit from there. Then what happened? Yes, at about 2.30, the mood shifted because they started asking us about our sources and uh, the types of interrogation strategy switched and I was moved away from my team. I was taken to a different police station and separated from the guys. The embassy didn't know where I was. I knew no one knew where I was and I was actually taken to the police station in the neighborhood of the protest. So of course the, the police would be most frustrated by having foreign journalists on the other side of that front line. Uh, so we were pretty nervous um, and that's really when the tone changed, that they started asking us for our sources. We of course refused. Um, not only because all sort of journalists have the right to protect their sources, but more importantly that these sources in Bahrain are so vulnerable. People are hunted on a daily basis for speaking out. So uh, for them to even meet with us is a really high risk for these these protesters, and we certainly wanted to protect their safety. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, given the, the, the high scope and high likelihood that not only a journalist is going to be in prison, but as you say, uh, I mean, the, the cost and mm -hmm. the human toll on civilians as a result of, of this government crackdown seems to be just appalling. Um, you obviously have materials on you uh, from the, you know, the filming that you've been doing, the photographing you've been doing. Um, what did they do to, to try and get that from you? I mean, you know, were they asking you about that kind of thing? Yes, uh, they were, and uh, they had a hard drive that had some of the material copied. We were quite panicked about that uh, because of, again, the safety of, of the people that we spoke with. Most of them covered their faces when they were interviewed with us. Uh, but, you know, just even thinking through it as we sat in custody, you know, I'm trying to remember, did, did that young man take his mask off before we pulled the camera down, you know, just at the end of the interview. So we were really panicked about that. Um, but at this point, they, they've confiscated all of our electronics, uh, not only the camera gear that we had on us, but they uh, broke into our apartment when we were finally returned to our apartment right before our deportation. The entire apartment had been uh, totally... Uh, uh, totally trashed um, and thousands of dollars were taken as well as all of our other electronics so we were really uh, quite nervous about our safety and right now they have about twenty thousand dollars worth of gear uh, in police custody in Bahrain. Wow. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, the, the ransacking, just the sort of violation on, on so many levels of not only your personal safety, but also then just the, the, the safety of the story in and of itself, you know, the, the, the way that the government seemed to have been so insidious and in trying to go after anybody that wants to speak out. Um, obviously, it doesn't escape our audience that you're a woman and you're a woman going into a situation like Bahrain. Now, female journalists have always been and, and have been for a long time on the front lines like you are. Um, how did the Bahraini custody and, and the Bahraini police treat you in prison? Uh, I think I was treated a bit differently because I was the producer on the shoot, so they knew that I had the sources in my head. Um, so, so I would say that's probably why I got a more harsher in, or a much harsher interrogation than, than my male colleagues. Uh, but, you know, we were held for 48 hours, and, and of course in that 48 hours we were you know, terrified, uh, and we're facing, you know, we, we were scared that we would face, you know, the fate of Al Jazeera journalists or something in Egypt. Uh, but just one example, just for a little context, uh, I have a colleague there, um, Nazia Syed, when she, she's a reporter just like me, um, she was reporting on the 2011 uprising, arrested. Um, while in custody, she was blindfolded, beaten with a pipe, uh, her head was thrown in a toilet, she was electrocuted. I mean, this is the high stakes of being a Bahraini journalist without an American passport or, you know, an embassy that will, will come accelerate your release. Uh, so as much as we were certainly terrified, we realized, you know, we, we left 
in circumstances based entirely on privilege while our our colleagues, again, at least 10 of them are languishing in prison. And I think it's extremely important to point that out as you as you have and you're so concerned. And I know this uh, from, from knowing you is about the, the, the local journalists who often, as you say, get the brunt and the full force of the government. Um, but for you, I mean, you know, taking it just solely for you and, and the context that you found yourself in, um, what were they telling you? What were they saying that they were going to be doing? Uh, they again first it was this uh first it was calling us journalists and um and they were saying you know we do have a process for journalists who apply for a visa and we would have given it to you and you know that's just not the case or they would have tracked us and endangered our contacts so uh but i did say and and they have proof of this we we plan to come back in march for the bahrain's grand prix uh we wanted to show you know really the uh the festivities there of the government and also do an embark on the fifth fleet so we did have plans to get the other side of the story uh, so so we did have this professional conversation but again think the tide really turned when they started asking for sources and when we didn't cooperate we were accused of being uncooperative um, and at several points we were not allowed to talk to the embassy or lawyers or our families um, and so I was uncooperative in in those uh, situations and literally had to throw fits to be able to even contact the embassy by the time I was able to get the embassy you know I was saying on the phone listen I'm going to get rearrested assume they are not letting us contact you and the only way I'm being able to make any calls is when I have you know a fit uh, so and, and we're being mistreated and when you so. say you're throwing a fit I mean like what were you doing uh, after the first interrogation about our sources uh, I came out and you know at first I had said things like I had a call at midnight for work and again we thought we were going to be detained questioned deported uh, like a Japanese colleague who was there the previous week um, and I said I'm gonna need my cell phone back by midnight and they were like yeah you'll be out of here by midnight and I think the police even thought we're just gonna follow this kind of rule book and then things changed very quickly so uh, so I think that's that was the that was the scariest part that everything started to turn against us and that I was isolated from everyone so they actually took you away from your colleagues, like you yes. were kept separate. Yes, and I, and I was taken to different locations. Um, and by the second night, they had moved us to four separate prisons across the island. Uh, so, so that kind of uh, it seemed like they were trying to prevent us from getting the legal access. That, in fact, after the first day of detention, we complained to the prosecutor when he gave us a sentencing, and he gave a court order. Uh, he said there are laws in Bahrain that protect. You know, people in police custody, they were not followed. Uh, and he gave us a court order that the police were supposed to respect, which they did not. Uh, so that was very frightening that the minute we were back in police custody, it was just a vacuum of justice and, and we had, you know, no way to communicate. We had two instances of mistreatment that were going to be uh, filing formal complaints and hopefully charges against the government. Right now, our case is still ongoing. Uh, we were released. Um, and deported while the investigation is ongoing. Um, and they have, right now, while they continue this investigation, they have our gear um, and our, our things. So we are trying to cooperate, but uh, we do feel like there was mistreatment. And the prosecutor's office even affirmed that uh, that he didn't see some of the behavior as in accordance with Bahraini law. So we do want to follow up about these things. Um, again, because we think because we have this privileged status, we almost have a responsibility to make sure that it is documented that they are abusing um, abusing civilians. When you're in that situation where you, you feel that you're being mistreated, you are being mm -hmm. mistreated, and you've been separated from your colleagues, you've been moved around, you're tired, you don't yeah, know really exhausted. where you are, you're exhausted, <laughs> you've been covering protests, it's not like you've been on some sort of vacation. Um, what were you telling yourself? You know, What were you saying to yourself to be able to to, to function, to be able to get through the next day? Uh, <laughs> I didn't handle it very well, to be honest. Uh, I think that was a lesson that I would not do well in captivity. Um, I felt incredibly out of control of everything. And, you know, I've had a hostile environment training where they say the first thing in, when you're in captivity is to accept that you are out of control of everything. And once you can accept that, then you're preserving your physical health. Uh, again, thank God we were only in 48 hours. You know, we didn't need to get to that, but I had a very difficult time accepting that I was out of control of everything um, and, and didn't really preserve my strength. I was incredibly upset uh, and 
And again, when you're being denied food and water, you actually do need to keep yourself calm.